In 1938, a single locomotive changed everything. When the EMDFT rolled out of Lagrange, Illinois, it wasn't just another experiment in diesel-electric power. It was the beginning of the end for steam, the moment America's railroads quietly crossed the line between the past and the future. Beneath the FT's streamlined body were two identical engines, the EMD-567, each producing 1,000 horsepower. Together, they would deliver a blow so decisive that within two decades, steam locomotives would vanish from mainline service. But the real miracle wasn't just that it worked. It was how it worked. The 567 wasn't supposed to exist. By the logic of 1930s engineering, it shouldn't have worked at all. Two-stroke diesels, most experts said, were too crude for railroads, too dirty, too inefficient, too fragile to survive the brutal duty cycles of long-haul service. Yet somehow, this odd, howling, gear-driven monster didn't just survive, it conquered. <laughs> When Electromotive Division of General Motors introduced the 567 in 1938, they were already years ahead of their competition. While Alco and Baldwin were still refining massive four-stroke engines, EMD engineers quietly perfected a compact two-stroke V-type that could run for weeks without failure. The 567 took its name from the displacement of each cylinder, 567 cubic inches, with an 8.5-inch bore and a 10-inch stroke. Each cylinder displaced more than most entire automobile engines of the era. Multiply that by 12 or 16, and you had a machine capable of producing sustained horsepower numbers unheard of in mobile diesel applications. But displacement alone doesn't make a legend. The genius of the 567 was in its engineering philosophy, simplicity, modularity, and serviceability. The engine block was a masterpiece of cast minite iron, rigid and stable enough to handle the hammering of 16 cylinders firing in perfect rhythm. The 45-degree V configuration kept it short and balanced, ideal for mounting in a locomotive frame where space and weight were everything. Every system, from the injectors to the blower drive, was mechanically integrated, eliminating the spaghetti of belts, pumps and hoses that plagued other designs. The result was a diesel engine that looked more like a piece of architecture than a machine. Overbuilt, symmetrical, and made to last. The two-stroke uniflow design was at the heart of the 567 magic. Each cylinder had ports in the liner for intake air and four poppet exhaust valves in the cylinder head. As the piston descended, it uncovered the intake ports, allowing pressurized air from the roots blower to rush in. This air pushed the spent exhaust gases up and out through the open valves. In a single downward stroke, the cylinder was both cleared and recharged a mechanical ballet happening hundreds of times per second. Unlike a four-stroke, which produces one power stroke every two revolutions, the two-stroke 567 fired every revolution. That meant double the power density in the same footprint. The blower wasn't optional. It was vital. Instead of relying on exhaust-driven turbocharging, EMD used a mechanically-driven root supercharger, ensuring that the engine had full scavenging pressure at all times. Even at idle, the blower kept the air moving, purging the cylinders, and maintaining perfect combustion. This is why the 567 sound was so unique, a sharp, mechanical bark underscored by the rising whine of twin blowers moving air like turbines. It wasn't music. It was momentum, distilled. But what really set the 567 apart wasn't what it did. It was how railroads could live with it. Steam locomotives, for all their majesty, were maintenance nightmares. They required daily servicing, weekly boiler washes, and monthly teardowns. They leaked, cracked, and scaled. When they failed, entire crews of boilermakers, pipe fitters, and machinists were called in. The 567 made all that obsolete with one simple idea, the power assembly. Each cylinder of the 567 was a self-contained module, liner, piston, connecting rod, and head all bolted together as a single unit. When something went wrong, mechanics didn't disassemble the engine. They just lifted out the entire assembly and dropped in a rebuilt one. A job that took weeks on a steam locomotive took hours on a diesel. By afternoon, a locomotive could be back in service, earning money, not sitting cold in a roundhouse. That modularity wasn't just convenience. It was economic revolution.
EMD understood that reliability wasn't about perfection. It was about recovery time. Trains break. Things fail. What matters is how fast you can get moving again. That's where EMD's system-level thinking came in. They didn't just sell engines. They sold complete systems. Engine, generator, traction motors, control systems, and training, all designed to work together. While competitors offered piecemeal solutions, EMD offered turnkey reliability, and the 567 was the cornerstone of that philosophy. The company even built training schools, complete with cutaway engines and transparent models, so railroad mechanics could understand the internal flow of air, fuel, and power. They were taught not just to repair, but to think like engineers. This was GM's industrial genius at work, make complex technology so standardized that anyone could keep it running, and it worked. By 1940, the 567 had proven itself in the FT Demonstrator, a four-unit locomotive consist that toured the nation, proving diesel's supremacy over steam. On mountain grades, desert plains, and freezing northern lines, it outperformed and outlasted everything in its path. Railroad executives who had sworn by steam watched the FT pull more freight with less fuel and almost no maintenance. The demonstration broke the last illusion that steam could compete. When the US entered World War II, EMD's Lagrange plant became one of America's most strategic e-assets. The same 567 design that powered freight locomotives also drove Navy landing craft, submarine chasers, and auxiliary vessels. The modular architecture made production scalable, repair simple, and field service easy, exactly what the military needed. By 1945, thousands of 567 engines were running across land and sea, and unlike their competitors' complex four strokes, they just kept running. After the war, America's railroads were ready to rebuild, and dieselization exploded. The GP7, introduced in 1949, and its successor, the GP9, became the workhorses of post-war freight. Both ran 567 power, the GP7 with a 567B and the GP9 with a 567C, rated up to 1,750 horsepower. The numbers weren't what mattered. The reliability was. These locomotives could run 100,000 miles between major overhauls, something no steam engine had ever achieved. The 567's standardized design meant that parts from one engine fit another. Whether a railroad ran six-cylinder switches or 16-cylinder road units, the power assemblies, injectors, and blowers were all interchangeable. It was genius-level logistics. One parts inventory for an entire fleet. And as railroads adopted the GP series, something profound happened. The very sound of railroading changed. The hiss and clank of steam gave way to the deep, rhythmic thrum of two-stroke power. Roundhouses that once echoed with hammers and fire now buzzed with the steady idle of 567s under fluorescent light. The old skills faded. Blacksmiths replaced by diesel techs, firemen replaced by electricians. This was more than mechanical progress. It was cultural extinction and rebirth. The 567 wasn't just a new engine. It was the machine that redefined what railroad power could be. But even revolutions evolve. By the late 1950s, EMD was already preparing the next step, the 645 series, an enlarged and refined version of the same architecture. Yet the 567 never truly disappeared. Many locomotives labeled as 567s today actually contain 645 power assemblies inside their original 567 crankcases. EMD had designed the new parts to be backward compatible, a move that let railroads upgrade their fleets without scrapping them. It was an engineer's dream, evolution without obsolescence, and it blurred the line between eras. A GP9 built in 1954 could, by the 1970s, be running with entirely new internal components, modernized, but still beating with the same two-stroke rhythm that started it all. Even decades later, when turbos replaced blowers and electronics replaced governors, the heart of the design remained. The uniflow scavenging, the unit injectors, the modular assemblies, all of it traced back to that 1938 breakthrough. The EMD 567 didn't just end the steam age, it created the diesel age, and in doing so, rewrote the entire economic model of American railroading. It taught railroads that reliability wasn't about eliminating failure, 
It was about designing for it. It proved that a two-stroke, once dismissed as crude, could become the most successful locomotive engine ever built. By the time the last 567s left mainline service, they had logged millions of hours, yet thousands still run today, in yard switches, in museum consists, in tugboats and stationary generators. They were never meant to become legends. They just refused to die. By the time the first post-war GP locomotives entered service, the 5M67 had already cemented its reputation as the engine that made diesels inevitable. But EMD didn't stop. They refined, upgraded, and expanded the design, turning a wartime workhorse into a modular power system that could fit almost any locomotive configuration imaginable. The 567, B, C, and D series represented the evolution of a proven design. Each generation added subtle but crucial improvements, stronger crankcases, better cooling passages, improved injectors, and upgraded cylinder heads. The foundation never changed. Two-stroke, uniflow scavenging, roots-blown air, and unit injection. But the refinement was relentless. The 567C, introduced in the early 1950s, was a masterpiece of incremental engineering. Its crankcase was stiffer, its bearings more durable, and its heads more efficient at heat transfer. The 567D EMD took the final step, adding turbocharging, and not just any turbocharger. This one was gear-assisted, designed to overcome the biggest limitation of two-stroke engines, dependence on scavenging air at all times. The EMD turbocharger was a mechanical marvel. At low speeds, it acted as a supercharger, mechanically driven by the engine through a gear train and overrunning clutch. This kept the scavenging air constant during idle and light loads. As engine speed increased and exhaust energy rose, the clutch disengaged and the turbocharger transitioned to exhaust-driven operation. It was elegant, efficient, and unlike anything else in locomotive engineering. The turbo's center section was oil lubricated, cooled by a water-to-air aftercooler that reduced charge air temperature and increased power density. This system eliminated turbo lag and provided full boost instantly, a crucial feature for locomotives pulling heavy freight trains from a dead stop. With the 567D's turbocharging system, EMD pushed the two-stroke concept to its absolute limit. The result was an engine that could produce up to 2,500 horsepower while retaining the same displacement and architecture as the original 1938 design. The same core engine could power everything from yard switches to streamlined passenger trains. The SW7, SW9, and SW1200 switches carried smaller V6, V8, or V12 versions of the 567. They spent their lives crawling through yards, coupling cars, and idling for hours. The two-stroke design thrived under those conditions, while four-stroke competitors fouled injectors and carbonized valves at low load. The constant scavenging of the 567 kept it clean and efficient. The SW1200 was particularly iconic, a compact V12 putting out 1,200 horsepower, built from the same power assemblies as its big road unit brothers. Mechanics trained on a 16-cylinder GP9 could rebuild an SW1200 blindfolded. The parts were identical, the maintenance procedures identical, and even the sound identical, scaled only by cylinder count. That standardization gave EMD an advantage no one else could match. A railroad could operate a mixed fleet of switches, road units, and passenger locomotives, all sharing the same engines, parts bins, and training materials. Then came the E-units, streamlined passenger locomotives, that became symbols of post-war luxury rail travel. The E7, E8, and E9 models each carried two 12-cylinder 567 engines, driving twin generators for a combined 2,000 to 2,400 horsepower. The dual-engine arrangement wasn't just about power. It was about reliability. If one engine failed mid-run, the train could continue on the other. For passenger schedules measured in minutes, that redundancy was priceless. The layout was also beautifully efficient. Each engine was mounted longitudinally in the carbody, driving separate electrical systems that merged at the traction motors. The result was smooth acceleration, constant torque, and near-perfect load balance. And while their elegant car bodies and chrome trim got the attention, it was the twin 567 inside that made them legends. They ran from Chicago to Los Angeles, from New York to Miami, 
in the age when rail travel was still something close to magic. Steam locomotives could never do that. They needed water stops, coal reloads, constant lubrication, and armies of attendants. The E-units could run from coast to coast with nothing more than fuel and inspections. The shift was total. Railroads went from operating fleets of machines that consumed men and materials to fleets that simply worked. EMD 567 killed steam not out of malice, but inevitability. It was simpler, stronger, smarter, and infinitely more maintainable. It represented a new kind of engineering mindset, one that valued practicality over romance and results over tradition. It didn't look heroic, it just worked. And that, in the end, is why it won. The FT that rolled out of Lagrange in 1938 was more than a locomotive. It was a declaration that the future would belong not to the machines that looked the most impressive, but to the ones that ran the longest. And for the next half century, America ran on the 567.